Okay. Hello, everybody. I could not be more delighted to welcome everybody back for another year of our Grand Round series. And of course, to welcome our very special guest, Dr. Deborah Estrin. Deborah is a professor of computer science at Cornell Tech, where she holds the Robert B. Tishman Founders Chair, serves as the Associate Dean for Impact, founded the Health Tech Master's Program, and is an affiliate faculty at Weill Cornell Medicine. Estrin's research activities include technologies for caregiving, immersive health, small data, participatory sensing, and public interest technology. And at a time where, you know, as physicians, we're navigating telehealth visits, we're wrestling with the EMR, or staying up late to lock notes, as I often am, it's easy to feel that while technology has great potential, it also has significant limitations that get in the way of providing excellent patient care. But to talk to Deborah is to hear about innovations three steps ahead of the way we currently use data and treat patients. She's able to predict human behavior and catch disease early and use that technology to diagnose and prevent disease to enhance human health. Professor Estrin has had a long and storied career that I'll only allude to by noting that some of the most impressive recognitions she's received include being an elected member of the National Academy of Engineering and the National Academy of Medicine, a recipient of the 2018 MacArthur Foundation Genius Grant, and this year was named the recipient of the prestigious Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers John Van Neumann Medal. Google Scholar reports that she's one of the most referenced computer scientists of all time, with her work cited over 128,000 times. And if that were not enough, she's the king of diamonds on the deck of the Women in Computer Science playing cards. It gives me great pleasure to introduce Professor Deborah Estrin. Thank you so much, Matt. So uh, as I was just telling Matt earlier, putting together this talk gave me the opportunity to look back and forward at developments from really the last 20 years of mobile and digital health. And don't worry, it's not a history lesson, but rather a forward-looking perspective. I was involved early and perhaps too early in the exploration of what we call digital biomarkers based on patient-generated health data. As a technologist, I worked to create exploratory prototypes motivated by clinical and patient need. And this covered around the period from 2007 to 2017. I then actually reduced my active work in the space due in part to frustration and part to distraction, both associated with the relatively slow rate of clinical interest and adoption, at least as I perceived it. And then more recently, two things brought me back. First, on the demand side, it seemed that in the context of virtual care, these approaches might finally fill needs, not just nice to haves. Since clinicians feel the limitations of this two-dimensional video conferencing technology relative to in-person visits and exams. And this became particularly salient, of course, as we relied upon virtual visits at various times during the ongoing pandemic. Second, on the supply side, Advances in computer vision and augmented reality caught my attention as powerful, if still futuristic tools that have the potential to transform caregiving in the home, a longstanding interest of mine that I'll return to later in the talk. So in the first half of the talk, I'll focus on digital biomarkers, both opportunities and challenges, and then move on to digital and immersive therapeutics. First, what do we mean by digital biomarkers? They are measurements based on patient-generated data that are intended to describe and explain health outcomes in a way that informs patient assessment, endpoints, and disease management. And as we use them and learn more, digital biomarkers will likely become relevant to diagnosis as well. For now, digital biomarkers based on patient-generated data offer a powerful and pretty scalable way to measure individual patient status and response to treatment. The data can serve as feedback to the clinician about changes in patient experience symptoms and side effects. And this is particularly valuable where clinical encounters are sparse relative to the course of the condition and the value of high fidelity observability is high. Whether it's an inflammatory condition such as rheumatoid arthritis or IBD, recovery from surgery or other invasive treatments, or most recently long COVID. These longitudinal data can inform how clinicians prescribe and type treatment and also how patients manage and adhere. And in addition to informing care for individual patients over time, these data support research by increasing the fidelity of clinical studies. In 2013, I talked about patient-generated data, small data, as part of a TED Med talk, where I reflected on my father's sudden decline 
during his last month of life. I commented on the fact that an emergency room doctor did not think there was anything unusual going on because my father presented well for a typical 90 year old. Yet I knew that this was not typical for him. I reflected that in retrospect, his sudden decline would have been observable in his digital traces, reduced range and frequency of daily walks, shopping for prepared food instead of groceries, and in erratic responses to emails. And I wondered if maybe that well-meaning but very busy ER doc would have found a digital pulse computed on my father's data more convincing or interpretable than he found me. Patient-generated data come in many forms and from diverse sources, ranging from infrequent surveys to continuous measurements of behavioral and physiological parameters. So let me say a bit more about each of those. Self-report and the data that comes from it remains a critical and still the most common form of patient-generated health data. While surveys and standardized patient-reported outcomes, PROs, are not new, the prevalence of smartphones has increased feasibility, although probably not as much as I expected. The user experience and therefore engagement is somewhat improved when we incorporate modern interaction techniques from social media, emojis or image-based clicks, likes and swipes, such as these alternative uh, photographic self-report me um, methods on the slide. But there is generally diminishing engagement over time, similar to alert fatigue. And so these are best for infrequent or short-term assessment horizons. Patient reported outcomes can also be collected via AI-driven conversational agents, both text and voice-based. Multimodal devices, such as the Echo Show on this slide, combine voice and visual cues to provide an effective platform for self-report and PROs. My former PhD student, Andrea Quadra, worked with colleagues from MSK to conduct an early feasibility study with frail older adults. And as many have pointed out, including Saturday Night Live, if you remember that episode, natural language voice interfaces appear highly accessible to older adults. Another form of patient-generated data come from less common but quite interesting active tasks, such as the growing set originally introduced in Apple's research kit starting as far back as 2015. These make even deeper use of mobile device capabilities by engaging the patient in quick sensor measured tasks. For example, the Parkinson's tapping test developed by Sage BioNetworks and Apple in 2015 used the smartphone's touch screen to replicate the traditional clinical observation of finger tapping with screen tapping. I re recommend viewing the Research Kit Active Task webpage for more examples, including measures for balance, six minute walk assessments, vocal biomarkers, et cetera. The resulting data can provide high fidelity proxies for traditional measures conducted in the clinic. This brings me to a third type of data, that provided by entirely passive monitoring of biometrics, such as activity and heart rate. Passive in that it does not require active engagement by the patient beyond wearing and yes, charging the devices. So for example, recently Apple again, introduced a six minute walk test for the Apple Watch in which the user does not have to activate the test, but rather a six minute walk period is automatically extracted from the daily activity data. Another example of a wearable, my personal favorite, is this Aura Ring. It derives sleep patterns and, and sleep quality metrics from a range of passively collected sensor measurements, such as accelerometers, temperature, and heart rate. To date, these devices are primarily used by consumers themselves for wellness feedback. However, they are also being explored for early detection of illness, such as flu and COVID-19, based on the relevant measurements of heart rate, respiration rate, and body temperature. Aura ran an opportunistic study that correlated antibody levels using blood spots, blood spots with the side effect response to initial doses of the COVID vaccine as measured by their ring. Having, I started wearing an Aura ring back in 2018 and I happily participated. As it happens more recently, I found another clinical use for my aura ring. On a run in early June, I felt my heart racing and started keeping tabs of my resting heart rate numbers as reported by my aura ring, the lowest resting heart rate achieved during sleep. It turns out that a virus in early May 
had triggered subacute thyroiditis, confirmed by blood labs. It was literally a hot hell of a summer. Of course, my ring did not make the diagnosis, nor directly lead to my recovery. But my aura data was far more up to date than my infrequent blood tests. And this was very helpful for me to watch the trends, be able to track as I was getting worse, not better, and adjust my work and travel plans to accommodate until after I really turned the corner. Developing an active task or wearable and recruiting individuals to use it in an open study is the first step in digital biomarker development. But it takes persistence and layers of studies to actually develop, test, and validate a digital biomarker. Research at SAGE and Apple stuck with it and built a symptom monitor, which is now cleared for Parkinson's patients, all starting with that original tapping test in 2015. And even more recently, ambient sensing was shown to be valuable for measuring disease progression for Parkinson's patients through breathing measurements. Ambient sensing means using signals in the environment to infer clinically relevant movement patterns. In this study, Dina Katabi from MIT explored both a worn breathing measurement belt and interestingly, ambient sensing that uses wireless signal reflection through walls, by the way, for detecting very subtle breathing patterns. It's a fascinating technology that she and now many others are exploring. Across these diverse sources of patient-generated data, the challenge is how to make sense of them. The raw data, looking at this sort of bottom-up, the raw data need to be synthesized into useful, actionable digital biomarkers. And only once validated can the biomarkers be integrated into clinical workflow, hopefully to relieve rather than increase clinician burden. Moreover, digital biomarkers need to be validated for use in the context of specific clinical conditions and populations. Changes in mobility patterns mean something different for a patient managing rheumatoid arthritis than one managing depression. And their efficacy needs to be evaluated in the context of the specific clinical objectives, be it tighter control of RA flares or medication titration for anxiety. And finally, they need to be personalized to each individual. We all have different baseline behaviors. So that might sound incredibly difficult, but we can borrow a lot from the algorithms already in pervasive use that personalize our, personalize our keyboards and our content recommendations. Unsurprisingly, the most promising results so far are from digital biomarkers that enable more continuous, out-of-clinic observability of an established physiological or behavioral measurement, a tapping test, a six-minute walk, or even social rhythms associated with behavioral health. Undoubtedly, over time, we'll discover previously unknown measures, but we can bring significant value to patients and clinicians by starting with established clinical knowledge. Governance of personal data, particularly in health context, also presents critical challenges. It's an excellent example of the need for public interest and value-based perspectives in technology development. We face competing values and trade-offs and the stakeholder and solution space is really complicated. On the one hand, obstructed data flow may impair care coordination. Now, thanks to standardization and policy, we're seeing steady advances allowing individuals to access and share their data to support their own health. However, the increased ability for individuals to share their data raises the need for transparency and public health governance to protect those individuals. Caveat emptor does not work when the individual is facing a new healthcare issue or emergency. In this situation, we all over consent. And at least in the US, these stakes are only getting higher. I thought these ideas around patient-generated data and a digital pulse was not particularly futuristic for back in my TEDMED days in 2013. And even before that in 2010, when Dr. Ida Sim from UCSF and I published this piece in science. I expected a revolution, but we needed time for evolution. It took most of the past decade for mobile devices to begin to actually impact care. And Ida describes that really well in her uh, New England Journal of Medicine paper. In particular, EHR and mobile phone penetration 
were insufficient to support a change in care, even five years ago, let alone 10. In addition to having now achieved widespread use of EHRs and smartphones for better and worse in both cases, innovation platforms and standards have emerged to facilitate adoption. IDA carried open M health efforts forward to IEEE standardization and the Commons Project created Common Health to bring clinical record access and smart cards to Android devices to mirror what Apple had done for iOS devices. And uh, Dime has emerged as a really excellent multi-stakeholder community of technologists, clinical innovators, academics, and founders. And anyone interested in this space should go there first and often. And the commercial market has created products as platforms to cope with the diversity of data sources and uses. To operationalize these tools, we need products, not only standards. While many early to market products, unfortunately, don't start out using standards, they do tend to adopt them over time. Vendors like Human API and Validic offer APIs to facilitate patient-generated health data integration and software development kits to build with, that, with those data. As Chrissy Farr, an excellent health tech journalist turned VC recently pointed out, these data sources are also becoming a bigger focus now that CMS has expanded remote patient monitoring CPT codes. While it's great to explore new ideas with technologists, present company included, when you want to actually deploy or even test at scale, these commercial platforms take care of the plumbing, which otherwise can be very brittle and undermine progress. So now let me segue to the second part of the talk. In some clinical contexts, we can advance from measurement to intervention, which has been called digital therapeutics. Digital therapeutics support interventions driven by software and or digital devices to treat, not just monitor, a condition. The touted advantages of digital therapeutics is the availability and accessibility of treatment delivered by a pervasive digital technology and the potential for direct outcome improvements. The market likes digital therapeutics because of their scalability and bottom line impact for healthcare delivery costs. Most of the early examples created special apps to address a range of largely behavioral health conditions. Today's digital therapeutics take advantage of the wider range of interaction modalities offered by consumer devices. For example, wearable event detection can be used to trigger more precise medication dosing. Apple, again, in a new study, is exploring whether it can reduce medication side effects by having AFib patients only take medication when an extended AFib period is detected by their Apple Watch. Other digital therapeutics leverage interactive voice assistants and chatbots that provide reminders or health guidance. And as I was thinking about this talk over the last several weeks, it was hard to keep up with the daily announcements of new digital therapeutic products. For example, MoodSpark is attempting to use audio assistance and reminiscence therapy to bring comfort and care to isolated seniors. I also include highly personalized multimedia discharge instructions in this category, such as those created by Telesophia. And finally, there are a number of products based on emerging extended reality technologies, which I'll now delve into a bit more. XR stands for extended reality, includes both virtual reality, VR, and augmented reality, AR. VR allows users to interact with and in synthesized virtual 3D space, largely behind goggles that, that uh, uh, block out the real world. Whereas AR overlays synthetic visual information on the actual physical world. There are numerous projects and a growing number of products that leverage XR for health education, assistance, and therapeutics. Mental health and musculoskeletal health have in particular been the low hanging fruit for digital therapeutics. This is due to the nature of those conditions and treatments and the value of home-based daily rehabbing. 
exercises. These interventions include real-time visual feedback on rehab exercises for, for musculoskeletal conditions using augmented reality, and exposure therapy for PTSD pain management and even stroke rehab using virtual reality. Most of the concepts I've described so far are intended for use by the patient directly. And now in my last few slides, I'll return and turn my attention to the opportunities for developing technologies for use by the caregivers in the home. Note in this illustration of a virtual care session, I have a person sitting to the left of the patient, a caregiver. Back 15 years ago, when I started doing digital health, my parents were well into their 80s, and I was motivated to address tech for aging. However, even though they both had PhDs in electrical engineering, introducing new technology for their independent direct use as patients largely failed. And I wandered off to focus on the use of mobile technology by more digitally native populations. In contrast, my actual medical doctor sister used the common tools of the time, telephone, email, fax, to engage my parents' caregivers. First, my father as my mother's primary caregiver, and eventually a professional home health aide. Okay, this is the kids don't try this at home part of the talk because it does not only depend on new clinical studies and products emerging, it depends on underlying advances in the technology itself. Consider this still very aspirational illustration of an immersive care system of the future. On the left is an informal caregiver assisting a breast cancer patient recovering from surgery at home. The caregiver has reached out to a clinical expert depicted on the right to determine if the patient's sudden lack of progress in their mobility exercises is cause for concern and wondering if they should adjust the physical therapy regimen somehow or if the patient needs to be seen in person. The remote expert on the upper right is there to help assess and give feedback. In this example, the clinician would use a virtual reality system to view details as if they were in the room with the patient and to instruct the caregiver on adjustments in perspective or pose using gestures and annotations in 3D. The clinician's guidance is communicated to the caregiver through the caregiver's augmented reality, such as a head-mounted display, providing detailed visual information overlaid onto the patient's torso and limbs. Well beyond the rehab example, this would allow a remote expert to provide guidance on a range of emergent home care needs, from assessments of lower limb swelling or labored breathing to changing dressings on an incision site, assessing and assisting with balance and mobility, administering IVs or managing ports and drains. Many of these tasks can be daunting to inexperienced family caregivers, as well as to home health aides who have not had the benefit of recent specialized training. To get started on this aspiration, we began work on a prototype using off-the-shelf state-of-the-art hardware and software platforms. Our current lab setup uses Microsoft's HoloLens and Connect platforms in a simulated home context of the patient and caregiver, and Oculus Quest for the remote clinician in their clinical setting. Okay, if you're motion sensitive, you might need to close your eyes for this next slide. It's sort of dizzying. In this slide, you see very early work in progress in which the role played caregiver on the left is being instructed by a remote expert on the right on how to assess edema in a pseudo patient with heart disease. In this case, it's a mannequin. It illustrates the bi-directional vision of bringing details of the caregiver and patient situation to the remote expert and bringing the remote expert's visual guidance along with uh, vocal uh, uh, spoken guidance to the local caregiver. And the technology offers some interesting features that even go beyond what's available from today's in-person visits. For example, the ability to capture images, make annotations, and to replay prior observations. For example, this would allow a caregiver or remote expert to assess whether the edema looks the same as it did prior to the patient's last hospitalization 
or if a skin infection is improving or getting worse. These demo videos show impressive capabilities of today's devices and software and equally point to the many areas in which there are significant engineering challenges for us to address before we can experiment, let alone deploy in real world settings. It's much easier to project information on a nice flat rectangular surface like a wall than it is to project it accurately on the human torso uh, or limbs. One promising nearer term direction is to develop asynchronous uh, feature, uh, XR features that leverage more widely available AR capabilities on mobile phones and tablets. This would allow local caregivers to capture volumetric observations for feedback from remote clinicians. And that could be done asynchronously rather than relying on synchronous interaction and today's still clunky uh, head-mounted displays. So to summarize, across patient-centered developments of the last decade, patient-generated data, digital biomarkers, and immersive therapeutics, adoption has been much slower than I naively anticipated over a decade ago. Some of this is well-known healthcare economics with underinvestment in subacute care. But there is new hope for accelerated demand in the context of virtual care. As you all know, telemedicine had been around for a long time, but demand for containing infection and availability of reimbursement changed the game in 2020. Clinicians who were thrust into using virtual care were somehow expected to diagnose, treat, and manage disease with greatly reduced signals, particularly since a very small percentage of virtual care visits had even the most basic form of vital sign instruments on the patient side. As we move forward with plans for continued and extended virtual care utilization, this might well be the context in which patient-centered technologies come into broader use, in large part because they address the needs of the clinicians, you, not just the patients. Recession and recent investment dips aside, the digital health market has grown significantly, as per Daniel Kraft's recent LinkedIn post. However, the market is not going to take a public health perspective here any more than it does in healthcare services generally. When you're a product manager or a startup founder, you have to focus on markets where you can capture, quantify, and scale value, as in revenue. As an important example, the opportunity of developing new caregiver-centric technologies and data is likely to be underinvested by the commercial market. Therefore, I see it as essential for academic research to lean in here. I want to end with reference to Atul Gawande's call to action several years ago. He called for the clinical and innovation communities to, and I quote, shift our focus from rescue medicine to lifelong incremental care, or leave millions of people to suffer from conditions that increasingly can be predicted and managed. The more capacity we develop to monitor the body and the brain for signs of future breakdown and to correct course along the way, the greater the difference healthcare can make in people's lives, as well as in reducing future costs. And so with that, yes, a brief formal presentation, I'm really hoping, hoping we can open things up uh, to Q&A and have a discussion. Thank you. Excellent, Dr. Astrin, thank you so much. I'm sure there are lots of questions out there. We'll let people unmute or raise their hands. Maybe while they do, I mean, I'll ask you what, you know, what I'm sort of thinking about, which is it feels like I'm already flooded with a fire hose of data of um, blood pressure logs and glucose monitors and stuff. And what you're suggesting is a future world where I'm going to be getting people's, you know, minute by minute or second by second heart rates and uh, movements and, and how... How does all that amazing data fit in with a world where, uh, you know, somebody's got to process it all? 100%. So th those raw data are patient-generated data, which you should really never see in their raw form. What clinicians need to see are the higher-level inferred 
digital biomarkers. And those may well be coming from multiple sources of sensor data, and they may well be trend information rather than absolute information. And that's the only way that this is actually going to work. And it's the only way that it has so far begun to work, uh, probably most in behavioral health. Why? Well, there, there's not even a blood pressure cuff, right, to have an instantaneous measure. And so these other measures that capture both social rhythms, indication of stress, anxiety, things that have, have come about are filling in the gap of the absence of a blood pressure cuff, uh, but also very much looked at in the, uh, with, respect to, uh, with respect to trends and patterns. Not for, uh, you know, uh, you're all very bright and all those things, but doctors should not have to become data scientists. That has sort of been the sloggy situation for the past decade. But um, even if you look at that progression from that original idea of this tapping test from the Parkinson's work to the tapping test on the phone, the data was not shared from the sensors. Rather, they did a validation test between people doing this and this. And then there was some uh, outcome measured. Similarly, like a six minute walk is not watching all of your patient's ambulation. It's an extracted six minute walk with associated um, uh, physiological uh, parameters. That's the work that needs to be done. That is by and large, not so much just a technologist problem. That is the work to be done by partnerships between uh, clinicians. And by now you don't, you don't need a computer scientist. There are products out there that generate data and you don't need uh, you don't even need long time frames, really, because you're typically comparing over the course of weeks or months whether something is capturing the sort of thing that you do at follow-up uh, in-person visits. But it's not, um, uh, it's, it's not the sort of thing that is necessarily highly profitable from the perspective of a of a startup or a product, it is just perfect material for uh, clinical researchers, academic medicine, with some support from technologists uh, to, to go about. Whether you're interested, again, in GI, in inflammatory conditions generally, in behavioral health, in older adults, um, there's a lot of room. And, and so it will, all, it will only really come into the clinical workflow when we have these digital biomarkers. Short talk, long answers. Thanks. There's a question in the chat about uh, physical exam for obese patients or um, ways to amplify or differentiate. Maybe that says electrical parameters, inability to hear lung, so lung sounds and heart murmurs because of the obesity. Of the ah, patient. really interesting. Really interesting. I mean, I talked in the past, you know, for example, a, for a, for a um, an untrained person looking at a limb and trying to figure out it, assessing edema versus, you know, in, an, in, a, in a very obese patient is difficult. But that's a really interesting space um, that I'm not thought about. Yeah. And I, I don't know how much work has been uh, uh, done in that space, um, but I will now go and look it up after this. Other questions from the floor? Otherwise, Dr. Weissman is going to call on you. Yeah, exactly. Or I'll just keep asking all the questions that I'm thinking about. Yeah. I know you've spoken in the past about some of the, those other sort of passive things. I mean, I think about, you know, stuff you found in like Google searches and stuff. I mean, are there... Some of those things seem like they're almost, I mean, the augmented reality stuff is very cool, but feels a little farther in the future. Taking data off of iPhones and, yeah. and Google searches and stuff seems like it feels much more. Um, the data are right. there already. So. Yeah. So where uh, are people, what are people doing? With a lot that? of people. Yeah. Okay. So from uh, um, Brownstein at uh, Harvard is probably one of the best people around looking at more 
Um, he did done a lot of work around infectious disease and other things. Remember the early work that Google did on flu trends, which had problems to it, but that they were an early mover, right? And there's been lots of improvement over time. So you need to get access to those aggregated data. A lot of people work off of Twitter data because it's uh, open, relatively uh, accessible. And um, yeah, it's good, I think, overall for surveillance and those kinds of, of studies. Um, once you get to asking individuals for their uh, data, um, some interesting work, uh, certainly, again, a psychiatry um, at uh, with Northwell Health and others have done this as well, where they ha um, had one study where on admission for the for a first psychotic episode, they had an IRB and they uh, ran a study where individuals would consent to share what's referred to as their Google takeout data. And so they consented to have their personal data downloaded, which often would include location traces as well as online behaviors. Interestingly enough, from that study, the timing, the temporal data itself was more interesting, more initially interesting than anything else because it showed people's erratic, so their erratic rhythms and their, and their rhythms of when they're up. If you're up and searching and doing a Google search, you're unlikely to be asleep. Of course, it doesn't mean that when you're not doing a Google search, you are asleep. So this isn't a way to measure sleep. But seeing more erratic patterns in on in just being online, your temporal patterns was associated and was seen for many individuals before that first psychotic episode relative to the previous because Google takeout let you get a long ago history. Now, good news is that over the last couple of years, uh, people have been more concerned about those extensive digital traces. GDPR and other things have put pressure on the tech vendors themselves to allow more hooks to get rid of and let make the system forget your personal history. So it's not so easy to get that historical data anymore. Um, and it's not so easy for the Googles of the world themselves to actually use it for something um, that is validatable at an individual level. So, um, you would think, and to some extent, you're absolutely right, those data exist. And so um, uh, and so they are being used. Uh, there are also lots and lots of wearable devices out there that have relatively standard interfaces. You go to Validic and they can, you know, draw from your patients, whether they're wearing a Garmin watch or an Apple watch or a fit, you know, a Google Fitbit uh, device, and they can pull down that activity information. That is also far more here and now than anything like extended reality. On the sort of on the continuum, and if you want to do a clinically validated study, um, it's quite uh, that is that is now quite accessible and doable to do that without having to build a lot of very brittle you know plumbing to pull in that data. Um, it's not the same as saying I want to go and do a bunch of machine learning over all my. X-rays or CTs or what have you that are sitting there waiting to be analyzed and associated with with the HR data. Like that's the big trove of data that's just sitting there, and that's what's attracting a whole lot of attention um, by the world because it doesn't require prospective prospective gathering of data. But it also tells you like almost nothing about what's going on with patients in between and outside of actual clinical encounters. All right, other questions from the floor, either in the chat or hand raising? I have a, a question if I can ask. Thank you so much for this uh, wonderful talk. Uh, so interesting to see for me specifically, the XR um, you know, advancements and, and the physical exam, uh, I think uh, maybe one of the challenges that I've noticed, you know, after the pandemic, doing a physical exam and the rise of, of uh, uh, virtual telehealth. So um, very, very interested in um, seeing where this is going to go. I guess 
Um, Dr. Eshin, I think you highlighted that there are some engineering uh, difficulties to really bring this to life. What are some other challenges that you think, um, you know, really bringing this into the, the world of telehealth? What are some other challenges that you think will arise in really uh, bringing this to life and utilizing it um, in, um, you know, uh, medical care? And so, first of all, what will happen first is more prevalent access to uh, you know, home uh, blood pressure monitors or other things that come with some of the fancier new uh, 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 virtual health platforms. And those are just direct, you know, the, the wireless thermometer, the wireless, et cetera. Second is the data that you can have from those patients that you're seeing virtually, the digital bar markers and those things brought into your care so that you're not, uh, so that you're getting some augmenting signals, okay? Then I do expect, and then I intentionally, I'm a technologist, right? So starting in 2007, I started looking at things related to mobile health, and then it becomes more productized and I, you know, I'm, I'm less, right? So now I'm looking at something that, yes, is knowingly farther out there. That said, um, there are products and therapeutics using virtual reality when that's relevant, and for patients who don't get motion sensitive, I will not put on a VR uh, headset in, at their, in their current state. Um, and there are really uh, intensive computer vision based uh, um, programs that you can do that allow you to, that give you very detailed feedback on position and pose and things that you might be doing for anything, again, from surgical recovery um, uh, exercises, even, even uh, uh, preoperative uh, things around these, all that, you know, orthopedic, knee, hip uh, sorts of things going on. Um, and then finally, getting to the point where we can really have that visual channel between the local caregiver, caregiver and the remote clinician, it's going to take, um, you know, advances in the hardware so that's more like a smart, smart eyeglasses, advances in the in the visual sensors that are part of sort of the rig that that capture that data well. So, but for better or worse, you know, there's this massive metaverse obsessed gaming industry out there, which is going to push the state of that technology ahead. And with fully disclosed bias, we can probably then leverage that for something useful. Um, so it's a long way. That's the peak into the future, but it's a it's a far off uh, it's a far off future. I'm delighted to get emails or anything else from people, um, you know, who have been in that position of trying to help a, a a remote patient's caregiver proceed with something. Particularly now, hospital, you know, hospital in the home, and everything that comes before that. We as patients are being helped, are being allowed to leave the hospital so damn early, okay? And the caregivers of those patients are handed responsibilities for which they have no training. So there are things along the way, right? You can take YouTube videos and insert augmented reality tags and notes. So, you so that's the kind of tool that's part of the way there that could well be useful because you go over something and then the thing that somebody has access to at home is to step through a YouTube video with these augmented reality notes and particular point, remember to pay attention to this or look for this at the port site or whatever it is. So I think that's going to be like the first version of it because that is supportable asynchronously on things like these devices. So we're just getting started experimenting with some experimenting with some of those things. And those are probably much lower hanging fruit than the real time point of view sort of thing that comes from these HoloLens headset. Dr. Berger has his hand up. Yes, thank you. Thank you for the wonderful talk. Um, first, I, I would say, I don't know which slide number it was, but the picture of the person actually sitting at a computer monitor talking to somebody with all the devices in their homes. I think that is what um, physicians need to start to get as our collective mindset personally. Um, so my question is not meant to be provocative, but I guess the, the biggest issue here is um, 
to me as a true believer in, in everything you said is the, the, the resistance that we have from the current medical establishment that somehow this is an unobtainable goal that if we don't have people coming in and see us, they're gonna get substandard care despite all the data to prove differently. How do we get existing physicians to do it? And how do we get the medical establishment to start teaching that this is the new norm? Much like, you know, for, for some of us perhaps on this call, you know, the idea of computer learning was still in its like, you know, infancy, um, not until really that recent. I, I, or I mean, it, it's a lot shorter time frame that this has been ongoing than people think. You know, I would say even in the 90s and early 2000s, people doubted this could happen. How do we get people over this um, cognitive hump to move into the idea that this is the way of the world. Um, it's not undifferent than the arguments business is having about do people need to be in the office to be on a computer versus at home to be in on a computer. How can we do some of this? And then I guess you sort of touched upon it. It, it is a multi-step question that revolves around cognitive issues of physicians. How do we figure out in a world where physicians are used to acquiring the data themselves and, and deciding at the point what data is important versus people that are going to want to see that massive back, you know, the sort of the data on the Excel sheet and not just what we're being presented in the larger sense to get an understanding that like what we need to look for are abnormalities, not the, per the person who's always running 100 and worrying about them, yeah. but what are the abnormalities and the spikes and the, and the differences? So what do you think we need to do to move our medical establishment cognitive needle would be the best way I could put it. Okay. Um, I try never to say that's a great question. So I didn't just say that. Um, two parts. First of all, I perhaps am more of a, not, not a skeptic, but um, to address the disbelievers, how do we move things along? Well, we don't deserve to move it along because we haven't actually shown that it equally and, and where it better performs. So we have to do a whole bunch of studies. And I don't mean, you know, a Framingham study. We don't need that level of longitudinal, you know, of, of history. But we have to do some well-designed bunches of studies to show in what context this is actually as good or better approach. And we might start with the context in which it's a better approach because you can catch things early. Um, and I don't think that, that clinicians should just say this is the better way to do it. It's not their job, practicing clinicians, to do the background research and try it out using their patients as their, as, as, you know, as their, as their fodder. It's not we need to do studies and we need institutions, Matt, to support that kind of ongoing agile as small as you want it. But do, you know, let everyone give them some capacity, right? Give them some buyout to do rapid iteration studies within your population for different conditions and with different things. Um, and not, you know, develop and wait two years to write some K award thing. And then, you know, two years after that, you get to do it. And it's already out of date with respect to what we're doing. That, you know, learning healthcare system, things like that. We, we need to do that. You guys need to do it um, within your organizations and turn what you're doing and the care you're giving to patients into this opportunity to explore. So I don't know that there are shortcuts. There are low-hanging fruit. There are contexts in which those data are missing more than others. Um, and it's a good place, uh, it's a good place to start. On your second question, I don't know. I don't know in that if I believe in that framing, right? You go to a doctor and they order a bunch of labs. And those labs come back now. Uh, incredibly and sometimes not so productively directly to the patient at 7 p.m. the same day they put in their labs and they 
are actively Googling and then interpreting and sending email to their doctor sister, right, to say to, to interpret what this is. But it comes with some guidance on interpretability anyway. So clinicians don't immediately act. They immediately suggest the next set of things to look at. And then they act based on that asynchronously. When they got those lab reports back, they didn't decide on the next course of action. So that's what these digital biomarkers need to look like. They need to look like labs. We could say that like everyone's being rigid, but somehow we got to this place that you guys operate fairly well with labs, imaging, blood labs, et cetera. And until I know better, I'd rather follow that pattern, not to trick clinicians into adopting it, but because I at least know that you and your institution can function that way. Thank you, thank you. All right, Dr. Raghavan. Thank you. I just wanted to ask a question about um, kind of the transition of all of this, not just into clinical practice, but into medical education, or I guess that would really be simultaneous. And are there any considerations about how this might specially fit um, into possibly graduate medical education or residency training? Cool. So a few things not necessarily consistent. One is that until we figure out that something is actually worth doing, we probably don't teach it to people as part of, you know, this is what you do if you're a rheumatologist. Um, but that's sort of obvious, right? Um, the the, the uh, early access to state-of-the-art virtual care situations such as Dr. Berger mentioned with remote vitals and things like that on the patient side, that's the kind of thing that, that um, I would hope medical education can start doing sooner to get ahead. Yes, we know there's all kinds of, uh, of equity issues. And then if you're used to treating for that, you're gonna treat people who have those vital measurements at home. Um, you know, there's the intermediate things of the blood pressure cuff that's at your local pharmacy and, and things like that, that you can, that we then need standards, it comes down onto your phone. Um, and then you get to you get to share that wherever it was taken. So I think that there's um there's uh particularly in general medicine and, and primary care, uh coming up with the standardized way that you can start to begin to do that and introduce and 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 show that clinical care based on those things works well, and then you begin to teach it. But that's sort of probably too obvious. I want to say that the um, augmented reality and um, some extent virtual reality side is really interesting for education. Not its use in patient care is good for education. Not ready for that. Like we don't deserve it. We haven't shown anything about it working. I was just giving you a glimpse into where I think things are going. But the opportunity to help people train and repeat training and 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 get feedback on training in the same way that somebody might get feedback on their range of motion exercise from a computer vision algorithm, right? The opportunity for uh, uh, for young doctors to get feedback on those things in education is huge. And if, if I happen to be, it's not that I'm not interested in it, but I just don't work in that space, that's coming even sooner, the role of, of XR in that kind of training. And um, uh, uh, Cornell uh, Weil, NYP, some, I never know where those lines are, um, has a center for virtual care that actually does training for virtual care. And they have training uh, uh, materials and procedures and people can come in and sit in little booths and go through training exercises with your uh, standardized patients and such. And so that's going to be like explicit intentional training on what do they call it? Website manner instead of bedside manner. I don't remember the term. Um, and also, while it's completely counter to HIPAA to record your virtual care visits and then leverage them, even though that would be so interesting, um, doing that in the context of training would be incredible. And in fact, looking at the use of these technologies in general in those simulation centers or those the context in which you have the one-way mirror and the and the uh, student clinicians coming in and interacting with the standardized patients, and then you're inside the room watching them and evaluating them. There's a word for it, but I can't remember what it is. Um, that's another context it's in which it's really interesting to start introducing 
both new technologies or you know patients then coming in and having some data from wearables and things like that. But again, I think what we really need, and if institutions you know like yours were doing things across multiple clinicians, and these things probably take three months and you begin to get some insight uh, into them, uh, that's the kind of thing that we really need to uh, to move things forward, to have things be worth teaching. That was great. Thank you so much. Yeah, I think uh, obviously making sure that it works uh, uh, or that it's implementable yeah. uh, makes a lot of sense before moving into the education realm. But I think also the idea of kind of uh, training as you go um, or building this into training so that people become yeah, comfortable yeah. with it once available, I think makes a lot of yeah. sense. Thank you. And there's a lot that is. I mean, there are products out there, right? If by the time a product comes to market, right, there's been a fair amount of use and there's been assessment of market. And so there really is stuff that absolutely products out there that you can begin to, uh, uh, to teach students about using. Right. I think, you know, I went to medical school during a time where computer searches were sort of beginning, but a lot of the tools that we use now, like up to date, didn't exist yet. And they were very particular about teaching us sort of the concept of like searching for medical information online and how do you assess sources and how do you, you know, ask the right questions and those kinds of things. And so I do, I mean, not only are we do I fear we're barraged with data, but we also get calls all the time from companies that are starting up and have solved all the problem or solved one problem yeah. completely. Yeah. And it's hard to even know how to, how to think through like which of those are, um, uh, you know, how do you value those different things? Right. How do you assess them? And and back to Shri's question, like how do you teach our medical trainees who aren't necessarily going to know like this is the product you're going to use for this thing yeah. but like you know how do you work in a world where even the not only are the diseases changing the treatments changing but the interact you know the milieu of interaction or whatever is changing yeah and you know some of it there are some things to learn from other therapeutics right Pharma also, you know, has a history of barraging the, the, you know, medical system. And then there are new, you know, new findings off label and all sorts of things. So, but the, yes, the, the rapidity and the behavior of the tech industry as compared with pharma makes it, uh, you know, harder and, 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 um, and that's why, you know, places have, whatever innovation offices or things like that, that try to separate those things. On the other hand, um, clinicians who their institution gives them some time to do it can go ahead and do short-term trials, which makes, you know, adds another right. dimension to, to, uh, to their lives that can be interesting. Again, it can't be done in visible labor on top of everything they're doing, but there's just an opportunity in every clinical encounter if the patient wants to do it. Now the data are going to be biased because of that thing of if the patient wants to do it, um, we have to be very uh, cognizant, cognizant of that, figure out how to try to balance it. Um, but it is still, every encounter is to some extent, you know, an experiment. Right, excellent. And I think Dr. Uh... Dr. Kwok mentioned about teaching empathy uh, as part of medical education. That sort of fits into all of this. Um, and Dr. Risk is chatting about uh, recharge tents during COVID and finding ways to use these sort of new things to help, uh, you know, help support our docs. Yeah. So with that, it's one o'clock. I think it's time to, to quit. Thank you so much, Dr. Estrin. As always, really delightful having you here to Thank kick you. off our really idea of grand rounds. Really appreciate the questions. Thanks so much. Take care. Take care, everybody. Thank you, Dr. Estrin. Thank you, everyone.